If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. And the last few weeks, we've been doing a series called uh, How to Deal or Dealing with Demonic Forces. And we, we talked about how, you know, you look through Scripture and then you can also see, you know, what's going on in society today that there's lots of issues and there's lots of problems. But we've talked about how, you know, many times the problem isn't necessarily the person, it's the spirit behind the things that, that, are, that are pushing and operating things. We have to understand that there's very much a spiritual world that's, vi- that's just as real as this world that we, this natural world that we live in. You understand that part, right? There's a spiritual world. And so that's why, you know, the Bible talks about that we are to be led by the Spirit so we can walk in the Spirit. There's a spiritual world that we should be operating and living from. Even though you can't see something doesn't mean that it's not real. How many of you ever seen your brain? How many of you know you have one? All right, so some of you don't, right? Just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not real. So there very much is a spiritual world there, and there's a lot of things that's going on that we may not necessarily see, but you do experience. Actually, before you turn to Ephesians 6, well, you're probably already there by now, but look over at John chapter uh, 3. I want you to see something Jesus said, just in line with that. How, how many of you know a real famous scripture in John chapter 3? 16. 16. God to love the world. Okay. So in that, in that conversation Jesus was, is having with uh, Nicodemus, he's talking about salvation, but he's also talking about the spirit realm. And uh, he says in verse, uh, John chapter 3 and verse 8, I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. He said, the wind blows where it wills, and though you hear it sound, yet you neither know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. He's talking about salvation here, but he also gives you a, a very real truth about the spirit realm. You may not see it, but you can experience the effects of it, right? You may not see it, but you can experience the effects of it, uh, of the good and the bad. And so we pointed this out in Ephesians chapter 6 and uh, get down here. And verse 12. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. So the Amplified is kind of a wordy translation, but it's good. It brings out some of the, the Greek stuff. It says, For we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural sphere. Therefore, put on God's complete armor that you would be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand. And so he tells you here that, you know, our, our problems here aren't necessarily with people. Now, I don't know about you, but there's been times I wanted to slap somebody, I wanted to punch somebody. You might want to cuss them out, all right? But your problem isn't people. Your problem isn't people. Your problem is the spirit that's working behind the scenes influencing people. And so that's why we have to really guard ourselves in being offended at people and, and, and harboring unforgiveness against people. And it's not that people aren't responsible for their actions. We are. We're very much responsible for our actions. People in this society do not like that. We want to blame mama and daddy and the government, and we want to blame this and that. Ultimately, yes, you are responsible for your actions. But we also have to understand that, especially when it comes to uh, non-believers, people who are not saved, who have not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, you have to understand that, and this is not a politically correct statement, and people get mad about this today, but this Bible is if someone is not, is not filled with God, has not received salvation, this person is being ruled by the devil. And it makes people mad. How dare you say that the devil is ruling me? Because God said it. You don't believe, look, let me give you the scripture so that if you ever make this statement, I don't, I don't, I don't suggest making this statement out in the, in in the store, you know, you're talking to somebody. And, but actually, Jesus, let me show you this. This is the Jesus that I like, okay? This is the Jesus I like that nobody talks about this Jesus. The Jesus we actually see in the Bible here. I want you to see how this guy was when it, <laughs> when it came to non-PC talk. Look over at John chapter 8. I've got some notes. We'll get there at some point. But John chapter 8. And look at, verse, uh, look, at verse 40, look at verse 41. 
Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here. Okay? This is John chapter 8 and verse 41. I, just, I, lo- I would have loved to have been there when Jesus had this conversation with the Pharisees. John chapter 8 and verse 41, Jesus says this, You are doing the works of your own father. They said to him, We are not illegitimate children and born out of fornic- fortification. We have one father, even it's God. And Jesus said, if God really was your father, you would love me and respect me and welcome me. For I came uh, on my own authority, or I did not come on my own authority or of my own accord, but God sent me. Why do you misunderstand what I say? It's because you're unable to hear what I'm saying. Look at verse 44. This is what Jesus said, okay? He said, you are of your father, the devil. Can you imagine that Jesus in our world today saying that to somebody? I, friends, I'm telling you, if Jesus was walking the earth today, I guarantee you a lot of people that call themselves Christians would not be a Christian today because they would get offended at him. They would get mad at him. They'd say, how dare you talk to me like that? Yeah. But Jesus looked at these people and he said, you are of your father, the devil, and it's your will to practice the lust and gratify the desires of your father. He said, your daddy is the devil. Can you imagine Can you imagine saying that to somebody? I mean, I have said that to a few people, but it didn't go over well. But this is Jesus. But Jesus is giving a truth here. He said, if you are not born again, if God is is not your father, he he can't be your father if you aren't born again. If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then your, your father is who? The devil. The devil. Look, this is why you see over here in Ephesians. Turn back over to Ephesians and look at Ephesians chapter 2. And look what Paul said here. He basically says the same thing, but says it just in a little bit different way. Ephesians chapter 2, and look at, we'll just start with verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 says, And you he made alive when you were dead by your own trespasses and sins, in which at one time you walked habitually. You were following the course and fashion of this world, and you were under the sway of the tendency of this age, following the prince of the power of the air. Who do you think that is? The prince of the power of the air. Jesus is referred to him as the prince of this world, God of this world. He said, you were obedient to and under the control of the demonic spirit that still constantly works. Notice this phrase, still constantly works in the sons of disobedience. Let me read this to you in a, uh, let me read this to you in another translation here. I'm going to give you a couple of them just to, just to clarify so you don't think it's an error in the Bible that you're reading out of. This is the, uh, the living Bible. It says, at that time you walked in the way of this world in conformity to the ruler of the, of the domain of the air, the ruler of the spirit who's now working and operating in the sons of disobedience. Uh, The NIV says this, it says, In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Uh, Another one says, You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is a spirit who is working in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Now, I like that one because, and we're going to see this in a little bit, because it shows you uh, not only is Satan operating and ruling in the lives of those who do not trust in God and who have not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but even if you are saved, you can still choose who you're going to be led by. You can. Let me me give you another one here. Uh, I like the Message Bible. Message always just kind of puts it to the point. It says, it wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world which doesn't know the first thing about living tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief, and then you exhaled disobedience. We all did it, all of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. All of us in the same boat. It's a wonder, <laughs> it's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and just do away with a whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. And so you go through reading this. Uh, This is good. The Living Bible says, You went along with the crowd, and you were just like all the others, full of sin and obeying Satan. 
the mighty prince of the power of the air who is at work right now in the hearts of those who are against the Lord. It doesn't matter what translation you read, Paul's saying the same thing here, is that if you've not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Satan is ruling your life. That is not a politically correct statement. People don't like that, but it's just Bible. And so this is why so many times we start off saying, this is my Bible, this is the Word of God, this is God speaking unto me, so that when you get to something you don't like, you can't substitute your own belief. You got to look at it and say, this is God speaking to me. And so either I'm going to allow the Bible, allow the Word of God to change my life, or I'm going to change my life according to the uh, you you got to make a decision. Either you're going to let the Bible influence your beliefs, the Word of God influence your beliefs, or you're going to let your experiences or your personal opinions, you know, change the Word of God like so many people do. And so you have to understand that, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, and I've done this before. And we've all done this before. How many times have you been out and about living your life, do, doing life in the world, and, and someone comes across and does something to you, just does you dirty? says something to you, maybe they flip you off, cuss you out, they do something. And you just can't, in your mind, you're like, I can't believe, I can't understand how someone would do something like that. And yet it's, it's always interesting to me that we get upset at sinners for acting like sinners. We get upset for sinners acting like the devil. But in one sense, and it's a very real spiritual truth, there's really no control there because the devil is their father, he is their master, and he is influencing them, right? Yes, no, yeah. I mean, this is Bible, it's right here. And so this is why Paul says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principality, power, might, dominion. He's talking about the, these, these, these spiritual ranks uh, that Satan has with his demonic forces, you know, just like an, an army or military, they have ranks. You see it right here with Satan. He's got rank and order with his crew in the same way that, that God does. And, and so Paul says, we're not dealing with people. Yes, I mean, there's, there's people that we're talking to and we're seeing eye to eye and, and, and we feel in touch. But you've got to understand there's something behind that. And the reason this is important to understand is that there's going to be some situations you and I are facing in this life. And again, it's not, it's not taking a responsibility away from people. But there's relational issues, there's financial issues, there's some business issues that are going on in your life. And yeah, there's people involved, but, but there's, a, there's a spirit behind that. And sometimes it's not so much you needing to deal with the person, you need to deal with the force that's behind it. You need to deal with the force that's behind it. You know, you, you can confess all day long, and you can, you can do your confessions, and you can do your scripture readings. You can do all these things that you think you're supposed to do. But if you're dealing, if you're dealing with a demonic force that's behind that, you've got to take authority over that. You're going to have to take control over that. And we saw, remember, we saw this a few weeks ago, that the same authority that Jesus has is the same authority that, it's the same authority that we have. Remember when Jesus called the 12 to him in Matthew chapter 10? And he said, I give you power and authority to heal the sick and to cast out demons or de deal with the demons. And then as the ministry is growing, he calls the 70 together. And he does what? He gives them the same deal, gives them the same command. And then in what we know is the Great Commission, remember, go into all the world and preach the gospel, which every denomination and religious circle of Christianity believes in. Jesus also goes on to say, and these signs will follow those who believe. And, and, and two of those was, he said, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And he said, what? And also, don't cast out demons. They'll, they'll deal, deal with demons here. And, and it's a shame that, that even in church, churchdom, even when we talk about that, one, it seems a little strange in our mind to even talk about dealing with, with demons or demonic forces. And two, it's sad that when we talk about that, people get a little skittish. We shouldn't get skittish when it t comes to talking about those things. But the reason people get skittish is because it's not talked about enough. And the, the ideas that people have in their mind is what they've seen on TV or something like that. And they see people drinking poison Kool-Aid and handling snakes and, you know, acting just stupid. But you have to understand, anytime we talk about this, we're always coming at it from the standpoint that, remember, Jesus saw Satan cast out of heaven like a bolt of lightning. He was cast down... And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 that just as Jesus was raised up, 
Come on, little Bible scholars. All right, let's read it for you. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 6. It says, And God raised us up together with Christ and made us sit down together, giving us a joint seating with him in the heavenly places. Right? So just as Jesus was raised up, when Jesus was raised up, in the eyes of God, he raised up. He raised up us and made us to sit down together with Christ at the right hand of God. Now, what does that do for us? Well, you see it in Ephesians chapter 1, same conversation. Look at uh, chapter 1 and look at, uh, look at verse 20. It says, This same power they exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him on, at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Notice this, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that's named, not only on this world but also that which is to come. He has put all things under his feet and appointed him to be the universal and supreme head of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So even if you are the scab under the pinky toe, I mean, you could be the worst of the worst of all Christians. And yet even being the worst, I mean, you could be the scum of all Christianity. And yet, even being the worst of the worst at the bottom of the barrel, Christian, you're still far above Satan and every demonic foe that he has at his disposal. God, that ought to give you a self-esteem boost. If you think you are nothing in, the, in this world, if you are saved, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I mean, you could be at the bottom of the totem pole of Christianity, and yet at the very time, you are still far above Satan. Far above every sickness, every disease, every demonic attack. You are far, far above. And so when you come to talking about, this is why when you talk like this, it changes your perspective on world issues. When there's pandemics going around in this world and there's problems going around in this world, you don't have to freak out. You don't have to get scared. Why? Because I'm far above. I'm far above. You, you need to look at life here just like you do when you get up in a plane, you get up in a jet, and you start to go up, 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 up. Have you ever noticed how the things that seem so big on the ground, as you get, get up 20, 30,000 feet, they seem so small? So, I mean, this is just a little, little extra for you, but when you start to get afraid in life, it's because your perspective is wrong. You're not seeing yourself from where you're seated Because if you were seeing yourself from where you're seated, the, 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 the big problems of this world would seem really, really small. Have you noticed that when things seem big, all of a sudden to you it seems like I need big faith? Right? Th think, about, think about sickness or disease or something like that. How many of you freak out when the doctor says you've got the flu? But how many of you freak out when the doctor says you have cancer? Why? because our perspective, we have been so conformed to this world that one is worse than the other. One, or let me put it to you like this, one is bigger than the other. Because you do understand that the flu can turn into pneumonia, and the pneumonia can turn into this, and, the, and they can turn into that, and it'll still kill you. Right? We've, we've allowed the, the bigness of this world to become big to us, and we've got to change our perspective. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 12, he said, do not be what? Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be seeing, thinking. Do not have your perspective like people of this world who, who are not filled with God, not saved, not redeemed, not seated at God's right hand. But he said, be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind, by the changing of the way that you think. Allow your perspective to align with the perspective of heaven. Why? So you can get the results of heaven. You need to see things the way that God sees them. You need to see yourself the way that Jesus sees you, that you are seated at his right hand, God's right hand, far above. Come on. Any time, I mean, even like when we had, and I'm going I'm to kind of I'm a kind of mess with some of your heads right now, but even when we had that tornado a few months ago, even when we had that tor tornado a few months ago, the vast majority of the city of Jonesboro would, would have been going, oh my God, what are we going to do? I mean, look at how big this is. But you got to understand what's behind that. 
And then when you understand the force that's behind that, and you understand the force that's behind that is actually under your feet, then all of a sudden, the byproduct of the one that's under your feet doesn't seem so big. And then all of a sudden, it puts you in a position where, you know, and people are going to make fun of you, but it puts you in a position where you got authority over some things. Okay, we'll look at, we'll, we'll look at some scripture here. You don't think I'm some, some nut that just smoked something before he came out. All right, so let's look at some examples here. I want you to see uh, Jesus and a few others here dealing with some of these issues, life issues, some of it uh, storms of life, some of it relational things, some of it dealing with maybe your best friend and seeing that in unbelievers this can happen. It can even happen with believers. But understanding what's behind these situations and how to deal with them uh, appropriately. I look over to Acts chapter 16. We're going to look at Paul here. Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. You find a story here, and this is a real story, real life situation that happened. Acts chapter 16, Paul is out on one of his missionary journeys. And in verse 16, says this, it says, as we were on our way to the place of prayer, this is Acts 16, 16, as we were on our way to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who was possessed by a spirit of divination, claiming to foretell future events and discover hidden knowledge, and she brought her owners much money by her fortune telling. And she kept following Paul and the rest of us shouting loudly, these men are the servants of the Most High God. They announce to you the way of salvation. And she did this for many days, and Paul, being sorely annoyed, says he was sorely, doesn't sound too Christian, does it? Paul was ticked off. He, he, was, he was getting fed up with this woman. Sorely annoyed and worn out. He turned around and, and noticed this phrase. I, I like the way that it says this. I don't know if they had it up there. It says this in the Amplified. It says, he turned around and he said to the spirit within her, he didn't turn around and chastise the woman. He dealt with what? He dealt with the spirit behind this. He dealt with the spirit behind this. You know, I mean, you can jump on people and yell at people and this and that. But, but really, when it comes to people, again, in this situation, this lady was not born again. And remember, we're, we're reading in Acts here. So Jesus has already died. He's arisen from the dead. Salvation is available. The church is growing and expanding here. So this is a woman. She is not saved. She's not born again. Paul recognizes what's going on here. And he finally gets fed up with what's going on. This woman, she's following them around. And yet, if you look at the words of what she's saying, what she was saying was true, but she was causing them problems. And, and after some time, Paul gets annoyed. And he finally turns around and it says he dealt with the Spirit in her. He dealt with the Spirit in her. He said to the Spirit within her, I charge you in the name of who? So again, this isn't because of something about you and I that we're special. It's because of the one we represent. Remember, Jesus is the head. You and I are the, we are the body. And so in order for Jesus, and again, this is, not a, non, this is a non-PC statement too. This will get you kicked out of a lot of places. But, because I had this argument with, with a, a fellow preacher a while back. But if Jesus is going to accomplish something on this earth, it has to come through you and I. Notice Paul does not turn around and say, all right, God, I need you to do something about this, this demonic spirit working in this woman. Hey, everybody, let's gather together and pray, and let's fast and pray. Let's pray for God to do something about the devil. Notice Paul did not do that. Why? Because you will never find, you will never find in the Bible where God tells you to pray to him or ask him to do anything about the devil. You'll never find it, ever. You'll never find one time where someone came up to Jesus that, that was de demonically possessed and Jesus turns around and prays for God to do something about it. You'll never find Paul do it, Peter do it, James, John, any of them do it. No. Why? Because we are told to do something about the devil. Why? Because we have been given, we have been given authority. That's what Jesus said. All power and all authority has been given unto me and he gave it unto the church. And so in order for God to do something in this world, it's going to come through you and I. People want to talk about the sovereignty of God. Yes, God is sovereign. He's a big God. But 
He intentionally limited himself in this world to operating through you and I. People don't like that, but it's just Scripture. All right, maybe you don't like that. I don't know. But 18, it says, he said to the Spirit. Paul said to the Spirit. He didn't deal with the woman. He dealt with what? He dealt with the Spirit. And in verse 19, it says, when her owners discovered that their hope of profit was gone, they grabbed a hold of Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities, and they got into a little bit of trouble. But this is when you find out about Paul and Silas being in prison, you know, and they began to praise God, and the thing began to shake, and, and God set them free. So this is one instance you see an unbeliever that's causing problems, causing havoc in their life and causing problems in their ministry. And so this ought to give you a little bit of a clue when, when you've got something going on. Maybe it's your business. Uh, maybe it's in your personal life. You've got something going on. You've you got some, some division going on coming against you, some problems, some harassment coming against you. You've got to understand that anytime you're stepping out and endeavoring to follow God, grow in the things of God, accomplish the will of God for your life. I've seen this so many times that any time I step out endeavoring to believe Him and trust in Him and do what He's told me to do, it seems like all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, you see something, you get a revelation of something, you spend some time and the Lord's putting, dealing with you about doing something, and you finally make the decision to step out in faith to do that, and all of a sudden, whenever, while everything was so peaceful and calm, and all of a sudden... Here comes a storm of life. And it seems like anything that could possibly go wrong starts to go wrong. Uh, Lacey and I have seen in our, in our what, eight, eight, wait, hang on, don't get 2003. So our 17 years, so we're working our 18th year of marriage. She ain't in here, so I ain't in trouble. In our almost 18 years of marriage, I mean, I've seen it time and time again. Every time we have, we have endeavored to step out and do something for God, it seemed like there was kind of a calm before the storm. Everything had been going good, going good. And all of a sudden, we start telling people about what we're going to do. We start stepping out. And all of a sudden, poof, all this stuff starts happening. And, and I, I've, got, I've got a little bit enough wisdom now with, with my gray hairs and, and this and that to realize and understand that we kind of stirred up a hornet's nest, so to speak. And so I don't need to turn around and say, God, oh God, why are you letting this happen to me? What are you doing to me? No, I understand there's something behind, there's a force behind that that's trying to stop me, trying to stop us in fulfilling what God called us to do. You have to understand that. And so when you begin to understand that, then you know how to deal with it appropriately. And so you, you don't have to be like most Christians who will sit there and fall on their face and cry and moan and complain and, oh, God, why don't you do something? Why are you doing this to me? No, you'll stand up and take authority over that demonic force that's behind all of that. Let me show you an example of this. Uh, many of you have heard the story. Maybe you've read the story. Uh, if you look over at Mark chapter 4, what are we doing on time? Mark chapter 4, and this is when Jesus was asleep in the boat. You remember that story? And there was a great storm that arose. And I want to show you something about this. There's some, some really good uh, nuggets here. But I want to show you something about this. Maybe, maybe you didn't know, you hadn't seen before. In Mark chapter 4, in verse 35, it says, On that same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let's go over to the other side of the lake. And leaving the multitude, they went with him just as he was in the boat, and other boats were there with him. And a furious storm of wind, of hurricane proportions arose, and the waves kept beating into the boat so that it was already becoming filled. Now, it's interesting here because when you, when you look at the Greek portion of this, this phrase, it says, a, a storm of wind arose. In the Greek, it's literally talking about, there's two things to this. One, it's literally talking about a, a storm of hurricane massive proportions. Number two, uh, you find out here that it's talking about this is a storm that just came out of nowhere. You have to understand that, I mean, these guys were fishermen. They, these were seamen. They were on a boat. This was something they knew how to do. The, 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 the guys here, I mean, they spent their life out there on the sea. They were fishermen. They knew when to go out there and sail and when not to. They, they knew how to read the sky and read what was going on. How many of you want, want to understand or you should understand, if there's a hurricane going on, you probably don't go out in the water. I mean, these guys knew what they were doing. 
There, there was a calm there. I'm sure they were out there and said, oh, it looks like a nice night to go out and sail, you know. And so they get out there in the boat. And, it, and, the, and the Greek tells you that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this massive storm of hurricane proportions, hurricane winds, all of a sudden uh, hits the lake and hits them. And all of a sudden, water begins to come into the boat. And, and we know the story. The disciples, they start to freak out. And they run over to Jesus. The Bible says in verse 38 that Jesus was asleep in the boat. And they woke him and said, Master, do you not care that we're dying? And notice in verse 39, it says, Jesus arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush now, be still. Some translations say, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was immediately a great calm. I, I like this. And now I'm not a Greek scholar, but I can read. Okay. <laughs> I can listen to people that are smarter than me. I figured, I figured out how to be smart like that. Listen to people that are smarter than you. And there, there's, there was this one Greek scholar. Uh, his name's Rick Renner. Great, great guy. Listen to him a lot. Makes me feel smart. I mean, you kind of feel dumb when you're listening to him because he's so smart. But then you feel smarter after you listen to him. But he was pointing out here that, that in the Greek, where, where our translation, our English translation, where it says, peace be still, he said this, he said, in the Greek, there, there really is uh, no way to really translate into English what the Greek is saying here. So, so when the translators put peace be still, he said literally in the Greek, the only way that it could literally be translated would be like this, that when they woke up Jesus, Jesus stood up and he went, shh, that that would have been his response. They just stood up and looked at the sea and, and the waves and the wind and went, shh. I mean, it shows you not only the audacity of Jesus to think, I'm in control of these things. But I mean, you don't see Jesus in the middle of the boat tell the disciples, let's call a fast and prayer meeting. <laughs> Everybody get out the bread and juice. Let's take communion. We got to do something spiritual here. Trying to find all these works, all these things we need to do to try to deal with the situation. No, Jesus knowing who he was, and, and by this point, I mean, he's conquering some things. Not only his mind, but also here in the world. At this point, knowing who he is and the authority that he has. Remember, he's got authority from heaven. And he looks at the, the wind and the waves. He looks at this storm of hurricane proportions and simply just goes, shh. And the Bible says, immediately... The storm stopped. And then he turns around to the disciples and says, you bunch of scaredy cats, spineless little. He said, where's your faith? In other words, how come you didn't do something about it? How come you didn't do something about it? But the interesting thing to this story here is that you have to understand the reason Jesus is crossing this lake to go over to the other side is he's going to set somebody free. You know who that person was? It was the person whom, you know, many times in the Bible, it, 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 refers to him, it refers to him as the demoniac of the Gadarenes. And, and this, in this region of the land, there, there was two men over there that were totally demonically possessed. It says they ran around naked. They were living, in, living amongst the tombs and the caves. And they had so much taken control over that region that no one could pass by. And it's interesting because this story that we read about and Jesus is asleep in the boat and all of a sudden the storm arises, you have to understand why the storm arose. Because Jesus was going across the lake, going to set, a man, set these two men free and also clear the way in this region of the country so that people weren't scared anymore and business and everything could, could begin to, to function over there again. Do you see this? There's a man that's controlling a region of the country. No one can pass through there. And yet the Bible says that this man, you can continue to read the story there in, in chapter 5. You can see that this man, I mean, it says that he's cutting himself. He's, he's trying to commit suicide, man. He, he's demonically possessed. He, he's naked. I mean, they have bound him, tried to chain him up, and he would just break the chains. And as you begin to read the story, you find out that this man had 6,000 demons in him. And Jesus, in, in his heart of compassion for knowing what's going on over there in this other side of the sea, 
He decides to go over there and set these guys free. Not only set them free, but also set the region free. And isn't it interesting that as Jesus makes this decision to go over there, at the time before they get on the water, everything is calm. But as soon as they get out there in the middle of the sea, because they're going to release the power of God, set someone free, allow the kingdom of God to be manifest in this earth, and all of a sudden, a storm of epic hurricane proportions comes out of nowhere. And how many of us have been in a situation like that? Everything is good. We get a word from the Lord. We have something in our heart. We feel like God's calling us to do, leading us to do. We step out to do it, and all of a sudden, here comes all the hell. And so you can make a decision. You got a couple of decisions, a couple of perspectives. You could be like the disciples and say, oh, my gosh, what's going on? I mean, I thought I was trying to obey God. I was trying to do what's right, and now all of a sudden, these things are happening to me. I guess I made the wrong decision. I guess I missed it. You realize how many Christians have missed it? trying not to miss it. They thought they missed it, but really all it was was an attack of the devil. And so instead of dealing, using your authority and dealing with that attack, they assumed, well, I guess I must have missed it. I guess I must have not heard from God, because if I really heard from God, then all these bad things wouldn't be happening to me all of a sudden. So what do I do? Well, I'm just going to leave that alone. I'm going to step on back, and I'm going to go back to doing what I was doing. And it's, the why, it's the why so many times, so many Christians do not accomplish the will of God for their lives. Because they assume this, this, this storm that's happening is because they missed it. But many times, it's not because you missed it. It's because you made it. And Satan recognizes it, and he's trying to stop it. But if you don't stop it, he ain't. And you cannot sit there in the midst of the storm and, and pray, God, do something about this. Because you know what God's going to say? You do something about it. <laughs> Friends, I, I'm telling you, I mean, if, if God could pull his hair out, I'm sure he would have pulled it out a million times. Can you imagine, I mean, what it's like to be him? And you got, <laughs> you got so many Christians who's saying, God, do something about it. God, do something about it. God, doing something about it. And I can just imagine God sitting there with Jesus and saying, Jesus, I mean, I know somewhere in here, I, I told them, I, I, we gave them authority. I, I know somewhere, I mean, Jesus, where is it? I know somewhere in this, in this Bible, in this Word, we told them that they had authority and that they had power over the devil. And I mean, am I missing it somewhere? I mean, I, I, I know it's in here somewhere. Resist the devil and he will... Flee. The, the, the devil is roar, going around roaring, looking like a lion, looking for him, for that person that he can devour. Resist the devil and he will flee. Use your power and authority over all demons. Isn't that what Jesus said? I give you power and authority over all demons, all demonic forces. Jesus said that himself, not just once, many times. But how many, how many Christians are praying that, saying that God do something, God do something, God do something? But if you're reading your Bible, God's telling you to do something. And so it, I, I always go back to this uh, over these last few years. When, when, when I'm endeavoring to step out and do something, especially when it's something big, I already know. I, I already know because I know the way that Satan operates, and you ought to do this too. You should know that when I'm stepping out to obey God, I should already know there's something getting ready to come. Now, it's not that I'm making a bad confession or anything like that. It's because I know I have an enemy, and that enemy is going to try to stop me. But if, but if I know in advance how he operates and how he works, I can already be ready and be prepared. And so when he does show up, I can take authority over him. Amen. See, you and I should never be on the defensive when it comes to Satan. See, there's a reason why Paul makes this statement. He said, we should not be ignorant of Satan's devices and his schemes or you could say his plans of attack. We know the way that he works. He has not changed things. It's the same over and over and over and over and over. He's always coming what? To buffet, to pound, to strike, 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 to try to wear you down, to keep you from going. Why? Because he doesn't have authority over you. He can't stop you, but he can try to get you to give up. And the only way that you can lose in any trial, any storm, any situation of life is for you to give up. Why? Because you're the one that has authority over him, not vice versa. Now, before Jesus, he had authority over you. He was your master, but now he is your slave. 
So you see, Paul, when, when he was being harassed, and, and this harassment was trying to stop the ministry, hinder the ministry, what did he do? Did he deal with the person or he dealt with the Spirit? He dealt with the Spirit, right? And then you see Jesus here. You see Jesus going to, to fulfill what God has called him to do, to go set somebody free, to manifest the kingdom of heaven. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this demonic storm of hurricane proportions comes to try to kill him, try to take him out. But Jesus took authority over it. And because he took authority over it, then they got to the other side, and he sets this man free. And you know what happened after the man set free? He turned into a great evangelist. This man who was possessed with 6,000 demons turns around and goes and preaches about Jesus. And yet this is another interesting thought. And this is just a, just a little side, little rabbit trail. This one's free too. But if this man that was filled with over 6,000 demons couldn't be tamed, couldn't be controlled, they would buy, bind him with chains and he would just break them like it was little rubber bands. If that man could be filled with 6,000 demons, then what does that tell you and I about being filled with God? Come on, guys. Come on. If an unbeliever, their spirit, it shows you what's, what, what your spirit can contain. If this dude filled with 6,000 demons, I mean, breaking chains, breaking binds, I mean, nobody could control it, all these things going on, what does that say about you being filled with God? You might want to chew on that one. All right, let's finish up here. Look over at Mark chapter 8. I want you to see this one right here. So we've seen where you have an unbeliever uh, be, being influenced, so to speak, you know, by dem demonic forces trying to harass the ministry. Or you could, say, you could put it in, in your situation. Maybe you're not in the ministry. Maybe you got a business or this and that, trying to harass things, outside forces. And so Paul de deals not with a person. He deals with, the, deals with the spirit. And you see Jesus, you know, he's endeavoring to fulfill the plan of God for his life. And as he steps out, there's a great calm. And once he gets into the middle of it, what happens? All hell breaks loose. And Jesus doesn't turn around and blame God. He recognizes what's behind it, the force behind it, and he deals with that. He deals with it appropriately, and he gets the appropriate result. Well, then here in Mark uh, chapter 8 and in verse, uh, verse 31, says this, he says, Jesus began to teach them, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of, of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed, be crucified, and after three days arise up again. Arise up again. And he said this very freely and explicitly making it unmistakable. And Peter took, get this, Peter takes Jesus by the hand. Can you imagine doing this? Peter takes Jesus by the hand leads him off to the side and begins to rebuke him. Can you imagine Jesus teaching you something? And he's like, Jesus, hold on a second. Come here. And you begin to scold him to his face. But this is what Peter does. Jesus is teaching here, and Peter grabs him by the hand and takes him off to the side and begins to rebuke him. And notice Jesus' response <laughs> Jesus in verse 33 says, But turning around his back to Peter and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, What? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan, for what you have in mind, you do not have a mind intent on promoting what God wills, but what pleases men. You are not on God's side, but you are on the side of men. He, put, he turns around and he rebukes Peter but he doesn't necessarily rebuke Peter. He deals with what? He deals with the Spirit. And, and so Peter, I mean, he's like one of the ministers of the day. I mean, he's been hanging around Jesus, you know, almost three years. And so you could put it like this, that, that you could have a believer, a Christian, filled with God, filled with the Spirit, and yet still be influenced by the devil. See, just because you're saved and, and filled with God, filled with the Holy Ghost, does not mean that Satan cannot still influence you. The difference between you and someone who's not saved is you've got a choice. You can choose to be led by your emotions. You can choose to be led by your anger. You can choose to be led, you know, by the devil and be offended at somebody. You get to choose that. 
Remember, because he's not your master anymore. He is your slave. But he comes along, and we've seen this over the weeks, he comes along whispering these little thoughts. Right? Didn't you see what that person did to you? Don't you remember what they did to you three years ago? 25 years ago? 50 years ago? And you know how it is. I mean, all of a sudden, you latch onto that thought, and you begin to see that thing in HD surround sound, you know, 4K video, and all those emotions and feelings start to come back of what happened to you 30 years ago, and But here's Peter, has been hanging out with Jesus. I mean, I don't know of a better situation physically. I mean, he's been hanging out with Jesus, and yet he even gets influenced by the devil. But what's interesting as you read the story is that it's around the same time frame that Jesus goes, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Son of God. You are the Christ. And Jesus says, what? You said, well, the Spirit of God revealed that to you. You see Peter led by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And, and there's not, not much time within that that you see him go on the other side and be inspired by the devil. And yet even in that, Jesus deals with who? Doesn't deal with a person, he dealt with the dealt with the spirit. Friends, I'm telling you right now, it's very important who you hang around and who you have around you. Because here's Jesus telling them what's about to happen. And instead of instead of Peter, you know, saying, Hey, we're with you, we're gonna hook up with you. No, he turns around and rebukes him and says, No, that ain't gonna happen. But Jesus knew his mission, he knew his course, he knew what he had to do. And he goes, Get behind me, Satan. Sometimes you might need to do that to some of those people bringing doubt and unbelief in your life. I actually did that to Lacey one time. I did. This was many, many years ago when I was growing in my wisdom. <laughs> she didn't talk to me for about two days. But we were dealing with a situation, and uh, we were dealing with a situation, and I mean, like, my shoulders... I had as much hanging on my faith as what I possibly could. I was doing just good, good enough for me, dealing with my, my thoughts, my mind, my emotions. And, and, and Lacey, she had just kind of lost it at this point. This was many, many years ago. And she had just allowed the, the fear and things to get to her. And, and we were talking about this, and we're starting to get into an argument about it because I just don't do well with that, and I, I probably should do better. But I wasn't doing good with it. And I finally just got mad. I really did. Because I'm trying to be faith man. And I'm, I'm trying to deal with my own thoughts. And now I'm having to deal with mine and hers. And she made it, she said something about, you know, well, what if this doesn't work or something like that. I think this is when we were getting ready to go start our, our first church. And I looked at her. I said, devil, shut up. <laughs> I did. I'm not lying. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not preaching. I'm telling you the truth. I looked at her. I said, devil, shut up. I ain't listening to that anymore. Now, you know Lacey, you know those eyes that she has. I mean, they're already big. You know, they're like cartoon eyes. Those eyes got so big. She got so mad, she went off on me. She didn't talk to me for like two days. And I heard about it for weeks. How dare you call me the devil? I said, look, I'm sorry. I probably should have handled that differently. I said, I was sorry. I just got so fed up with, you know, I'm already dealing with my thoughts and my emotions. And so, really, when I began to think, and I think about it, you know, really, I kind of dealt with it appropriately, just not in the right avenue, maybe. Because what I was trying to do was stop, because that's what was going on. Friend, let me put it to you like this. Anytime you're in fear, anytime you're, you're dealing with doubt and unbelief about a situation, you find a promise in the Word of God, and you're endeavoring to stand on that regarding your situation, and all of a sudden you start to freak out and and fear about it, and you begin to wonder and wonder and wonder, how is this going to happen, God? I just, I just don't know. You, you start dealing with this all in your mind. You know, it's one thing for the thoughts to come. It's another thing for you to capture those thoughts and begin to dwell on those thoughts, because if you don't deal with them, it's going to begin to take over, and all of a sudden, what you're thinking is going to influence your emotions and your feelings. And what you're doing is you're just opening up the door more and more and more and more and more for the devil just to come and run in and run rampant in your life. And that's the way that even as a Christian, born-again, spirit-filled believer, you can still allow Satan to operate and influence you in your life. It's because you open up the door with your mind. 
You know, I've said this statement many times. You know, Kenneth Hagin, he used to say, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can't keep them from making a nest. Well, you can't keep the thoughts uh, of doubt and unbelief and fear and anxiety from coming to you, but you can stop them. You can choose what you're going to think on. And that's why many times, you know, even when you're in an argument with your friend or your spouse or something like that, you need to think very, very quickly about the, <laughs> about the word that's about to come out of your mouth. There's been many times after I've gotten more gray hair that after, as Lacey and I, we've gotten an argument. We, we love hard and we kind of fight hard. And those of you that's been around us, I mean, we'll just, we just fight, but we love each other. But I mean, there's been times something was about to come out of my mouth and I grabbed it real quick because I knew it was going to cost me. <laughs> I mean, I just gave up on the animals, you know, now it's just a running joke. I just gave up. But man, there was times I was so mad, I came home and there was another four legs. <laughs> but we say that all in jest, but, but yet you need to understand that, you know, when, when you're making a stand for God, when you're making a stand for, in a situation in your, in your life, and all of a sudden there begins to become people coming into your life that, that love, and they do love you. They love you, but they're trying to encourage you or trying to help you, trying to use wisdom. You need to understand. There, there's something behind that that's trying to stop you. And I wouldn't suggest walking up to it and say, Devil, get out of my house and don't come back. No, you need to deal with what's behind that. Friends, there's things that's going on with this church, and, and there's so many times I wanted to get so mad at certain individuals, people, and stuff like that, but I had to take a step back and realize it's really not them. It's the spirit behind it. It's the spirit behind it. We've dealt with it in so many places, so many different situations. I've dealt with it in my finances. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this one story, and then I'll stop. I remember when I was in Tulsa, I was going to, uh, to Rama, going to Bible school there, and I remember the place that I was working at I worked at Tulsa, the, the Tulsa Community Shelter. It was an emergency shelter for, for homeless people. I was a case manager there. And so here I am. I'm 25 years old, and uh, I'm going to Bible school, and I have nobody supporting me. I mean, I am broke as broke can possibly be. I'm making just enough money to pay, my, like, my car payment, my apartment, you know, insurance, stuff like that. I have no money for food. So when I got off work at 730 in the morning, I'm, I'm getting in line and eating with the rest of the homeless people. I'd serve them, and then I'd eat what I, <laughs> what I served. And then, you know, I go to work at 1130, and then, you know, I'm going there, and I'm eating leftovers from dinner there. I'm just trying to obey God. And yet, th things are already looking pretty bad, you know. And yet, it made it really, really bad, because when I went to my work, and I'm not saying this to put anybody down or anything like this, but I mean, when I went, went to work, here I am, 25 years old, uh, good Christian guy, trying to, trying to follow God's plan for my life. My supervisor was a lesbian. Her supervisor that was there, she was her lesbian girlfriend. Um, my co-workers, one was an atheist, one was an agnostic, one was a Catholic that was only Catholic because her husband was Catholic. She couldn't even do this right, you know. And then, then, I, then there was a Baptist guy. I mean, he could outcuss any sailor. And the only reason he was Baptist because he just decided to go to that church one or two times. I mean, you know. So nothing against the Baptists or Catholics or anything like that, but I mean, these were the people that I was dealing with. And when I walked in there, they knew I was going to Bible school, and so they automatically assumed I thought I was better than everybody. And they treated me accordingly. And I dealt with that day in, day out for two years. And I mean, there were so many times I actually had to go apologize to my supervisor. I had to go apologize to her for the way that... <laughs> <laughs> for the way that I responded to people, because I did not respond in a Christ-like manner. I mean, there would be meetings. We're having staff meetings, and they would just start ganging up on me. And I would just get a little carnal and lash back out. And I can't tell you how many letters, because I wouldn't see her in the afternoon. I can't tell you how many letters I had to write her. This is before we had uh, email going on. How many letters I had to write her apologizing and saying, I am a Christian. I'm going to school <laughs> training for the ministry, and I should not have said that to you. <laughs> I had to do that several times. But I was, I was dumb. I was ignorant. I didn't really understand what was going on. I just thought everybody's being mean to me because I'm a Christian. Everybody's being mean. I didn't understand what was going on. Now I do. But right toward the end of that, I, you know what I started doing? I actually started praying for him. Oh, my goodness. Who would have thought? I actually started praying for him. And you know what? 
You know what happened? The girl that was an atheist, she actually ended up getting saved right at the end. I was so excited about it because I had this dream. She, she was leaving. She was quitting. She was getting ready to move off. And I had this dream about her a few days before that. And in this dream, I saw myself, uh, I saw myself talking. Because I, I, ne I, I never preached to them, never was preacher or anything. I just tried to live it. Obviously, I wasn't doing too well that I'm constantly apologizing, <laughs> apologizing by letter. But I just tried to live it. And, and in this dream, I saw myself, you know, talking to her. And so, right before she left, I went and bought a card. And she was a mean one to me. But I went and got a card. And I, I wrote in the card, just, you know, I want to say thanks for being a great, you know, friend. Well, she wasn't, but thanks for being a great friend. And I wish you all the best. And then on one side of the, of the letter, on one side of the card, I wrote, I know you know that I'm a Christian. And I just began to write about my relationship with Jesus. And I just wrote a little prayer. I said, you know, I, I just really want to encourage you. Change your life. Receive Jesus. And you can just pray this little prayer. And so I gave that to her. And she gave me a little, you know, a little pat side hug. You know, you arrogant little Christian. And then she walked off. And, and about a week later, I had a dream. I had a dream about her. And I saw her in this dream. I saw her opening up this card and reading that. And tears coming out of her eyes. And I saw her get down at the side, on the floor at the side of her bed and, and pray that prayer that I had written in that thing and received Jesus. I saw that in my dream. And it was about a month or two later, she had actually come back to, to get some things and say hi to some friends and relatives that she had. And she stopped by work. And I was just coming in from my shift at, you know, in the evening. And she was getting ready to leave. And she saw me. And you know what? I found out that what I saw in my dream really, really happened. That she did. She, she received Jesus. But it was because at the tail end, I actually understood what was behind all of the division and all of the strife and all of the confusion and all of the problems that was coming toward me. It really wasn't necessarily the person. It wasn't the people. It was that spirit behind that that was influencing and pushing and striving, using them to try to get at me. And so I just want to encourage you, when the storms of life are happening... Don't take it out on the people. Take it out on the devil that's behind influencing these things. Use your God-given authority that you have and take authority over the devil. You got some relational things going on? You got things going on with your kids? Take authority over the devil behind that. Tell him to cease and desist in his maneuvers in the name of Jesus. Stop influencing that person and this person in your life. Now, you don't have control over a person's life, but when that person is endeavoring to harass you, cause problems in your life, you've got control over that spirit. Now, you can't control what they do in their life, but you can't control what's happening coming against yeah. you. So I want to encourage you to do that. Okay? Well, look, we don't like to go without doing this. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't want your daddy being the devil. I'll tell you that. You that are watching online, you don't want the daddy being your devil. You want God to be your father. And the Bible says the way you do that is you make Jesus your Lord and Savior. And it's not because of your actions, your works, anything you could do or would do. It's all about what Jesus already did. So I just want you to pray this with me. Say, Father, Father God, I come to you right now. And I see in your word that you said if I would believe in my heart and confess with my mouth Jesus as the Lord and Savior of my life, that I would be saved. So I do believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth Jesus as the Lord and the Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you prayed that prayer, congratulations, you're a brand new creation in Christ Jesus, born again, and now the devil is not your daddy, God is your daddy. And now the devil is not your master, he is your slave. He's where? He's under my feet, so it's time to start doing some tramping. If that doesn't make any sense, go back and watch last week. We're not talking about tramping on the street corner, we're talking about tramping on the devil. <laughs> anyway, God bless you. <laughs> Have a great week, a great day. Tell somebody about Jesus. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you.